just a quick snippet of another Brick in the Wall, part two, because we're talking about the art of Pink Floyd, The Wall, and to the man behind both the book of the same name and all the original artwork, the cartoonist and illustrator Gerald Scarf. Gerald, thanks very much for joining me on the programme. Very kind of you to invite me. Well, very, very kind of you to be here. Uh, look, <laughs> let, let's, let, let's start in the present uh, rather than the past. Tell us about the book and the artwork inside. The book is something I decided I'd do during lockdown. You know, I've been isolating in the country and I've always wanted to put this book together because it's, I have a complete collection of uh, Pink Floyd history. Uh, and it's almost an archive of it. And I'd very much like to keep it like that. But also part of that archive is or are all these illustrations, not only by me, but by the animators, the brilliant animators who worked on the film. And um, I decided to put it all together in a book, a, a big kind of lush, uh, heavy, expensive book, I've got to say. <laughs> but it one of the one of the books has a print in it, so you get a, a print as well. Um, and uh, it was just really a matter of collating the whole thing and bringing it together. It was, it's a very good process for me during lockdown too to have something to concentrate on. And uh, here we are. We have this. A big fat book in front of us. So there, look, there are so many photos and drawings and designs incorporating the imagery of the wall in the book. But is there, in your mind, a sort of a, a most iconic image, a central image, or one that you're the one that you're proudest of? Well, there's one that I'm told is the most iconic, which is the scream. And I think it's partly because when I painted the scream, which is just a screaming head, um, releasing all its sort of horror and terror. Um, a watercolor painting that I did. And when I showed that to Alan Parker, he said, that is the poster, that's, mm -hmm. and he used it throughout um, for all the advertising and so forth for the film of Pink Floyd, The Wall. And, um, you know, it, it's a strange thing. I think if you just repeat an image, it becomes iconic. And, and, and so I'm told this one is iconic. And it's certainly, it, it, the, uh, original artwork sold for a record sum in San Francisco, my gallery in San Francisco um, sold it, you know, at a very, very good mm. price. So I, I guess that's the one that comes to, but there are also the hammers and the, the, the flowers that make love and, uh, uh, you know, the, the three characters, the teacher and the wife and the mother and, and Pink himself, the little figure that's being put upon. And then of course, mm ultimately the wall, which is yeah. what Roger's concept. How, how did you first get associated with Pink Floyd then? How did it begin? How did I get together with them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'd always done a little bit of animation. I did, the, for instance, the titles on Yes Minister. They were very kind of limited animation. And then I was sent to America by uh, the BBC to do uh, an animated film uh, about whatever I wanted to. And it turned out to be about America. I decided to draw everything in a kind of stream of consciousness about America that I knew, like the Empire State Building, Playboy magazine, um, Disney, John Wayne, Frank Sinatra, you know, all of, the, all of the things that were going on at that time. Uh, actually, even the astronauts were landing then, I think. So all of these images I put together in a film, which I drew myself, onto 70 millimeter film, which is a, has a kind of frame size of about three inches by two inches in old language. <laughs> and um, so I drew onto those with a, a grease pencil and my wife, Jane, colored the back, you know, and then they, and we did it together and uh, finally it ended up as a 20 minute film. And uh, that was shown on BBC two. And that, that's apparently when Nick Mason and Roger Waters were watching BBC Two independently and rang one another the next morning. So the story goes and said, we've got to have this guy working with us, he's crazy. So um, <laughs> that's sort of how the, um, the thing began. And they just then rang me up and said, how would you like to work with us? And well, I, I couldn't ever explain myself or, or, or describe myself as uh, rock and roll. I certainly wasn't a Pink Floyd fan, but I um, you know, I listened to rock music, but not in any strong way. And so I was quite surprised when I met them because they were civilized. <laughs> I met them in Kentish town where Nick lived at the time. And uh, when I walked into the room, they were all very polite and looked pretty well dressed and clean, not what I was expecting at all. 
And uh, he, they just wanted me to do some animation. And I said, well, what animation? They said, well, whatever you like, which is, a, in, in a way, the worst brief. Really. You need <laughs> a little bit of something you know, to get, get a hook into. And um, uh, so eventually, I mean, I, I, at first I couldn't come to terms with it. And I was doing sort of rather surreal images, almost like René Magritte kind of images of all sorts of weird things in space and I was way off target and I think what Roger wanted from me really was um, the what I you know, the social comment I was doing in other parts of my work but I didn't kind of click onto that at that point and so eventually it evolved and I think it, first of all I worked on an album called Wish You Were Here uh, and then Roger came to me one day and played the raw tapes of the wall and said this is what I want to do next and I want to make it into an album I want to make it into a show and I want to make it into a film uh, all of which he did incredibly and um, when I got into that that was a very kind of juicy project and mm. uh, the wall the concept of the wall was a very good idea you know how we're all cut off from one another and, well I mean um, I, I was going to ask the, the, the sort of the themes of isolation and abandonment that you have that are so central to the wall I mean it can't be a coincidence that you came back to that during lockdown no it's true I hadn't thought of that but I mean yes maybe that's what what made me feel you know so isolated behind my own wall yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, I'm an asthmatic so and uh, an aged so I have to kind of take particular care I wasn't able to even go down to the pub really so uh yeah. It, you know, I, it was a, it was a, now you pointed out a very apt uh, subject to, to work on. Are, are you still in touch with the band and to the best of your knowledge? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's I mean, they're, they're, they're great pals. I mean, of course, to me, they're not the band, they're just my friends, mm. and I don't think of them in that way at all. Uh, Roger lives most of the time in America, and Nick's around here, David. I mean, they're all very, very kind of easygoing and friendly. And um, and just my mates, really, I suppose. Do, do, do they do they still speak to each other as well as you? Well, that's a different matter, I think. I think uh, there's always been a kind of a, a you know during the time I was with them in the eighties, uh, the band was sort of splitting up. Then um, it's that old thing. It seems to be that you know it's usually that you know the a, a group of people get together. And then one of them or two of them start thinking, I'm the man, I should be, you know, I should, I, I'm doing all this on my own and I, I should be doing it on all, all my, on my own. And um, I think that causes these splits. I think that, you know, the Stones are an exception in a way because they, they've stayed together. Yeah. Well, I mean, most... Sorry, no, I mean, Pink Floyd, they, they were already a huge band when you, when you started working them, obviously, as you said, but I mean, you can't have imagined back then that both the album you were working on with the wall and the and the artwork for it indeed would have such 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 longevity that, that it would still be sort of relevant and talked about you know so many decades later absolutely right i mean it's just i, I had no idea at all of what i was doing and uh, and that it would you know reach such can i say iconic sort of levels and uh, I, I get emails every week certainly about it and um, I have people, some guy in America who uh, he asked me if he could have my images tattooed onto his arm <laughs> and half his chest. And I said, sure, you know, it's your body. You mess it up if you want to. I wouldn't do it myself. But anyway, and he explained to me that um, he was a Gulf War veteran and that the Pink Floyd's music and my images had got him through the war, right. which, which was extraordinary really, because I mean, they're quite unpleasant images some of them and to have them uh, you know have them rescue you from the horror war I can't think how that would happen but anyway there we are I mean there is a continual kind of interest in it and you're you're right I mean at that time I had no idea it would go anywhere like this and I had never worked on anything that was turned out to be worldwide really ultimately well you'd you, you'd worked I mean but so before working with 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 Pink Floyd among other things you you worked on Private Eye through the 60s and the 70s was I that worked on private yes I worked on Private Eye that's really where I began I suppose and there I was encouraged by Richard Ingrams and Willie Rushton and the, the gang who worked there was was that was that a, I mean was that must have been an amazing time but did, did you you know you're the sort of a, at the cutting edge of satire then um did it um I mean was it a sort of an, an empowering and invigorating environment to work in there well it it was but there again at the time I didn't kind of get it you know I mean we private eye office was this sort of dingy little 
room above a strip club in, in Greek Street in Soho. And it didn't feel as powerful as it turned out to be. And um, I would go in there and I'd be doing drawings, you know, at the last moment on a sort of side table while people were making tea and <laughs> showering sugar all over the drawings. And it was very, very, you know, it's great fun. I mean, it's great fun. And um, I, I, uh, I came to prominence there, I suppose. I have to thank Private Eye for allowing me to, you know, out, out my, uh, what was my bent, really, mm. to, to do um, apparently savage drawings, although they didn't feel savage to me, but, I mean, they were my <laughs> reaction. Well, you, yeah, I, I, I can't let you go without asking as well. You, I think you must be the only person I've ever spoken to who has a species of dinosaur named after them. Uh, <laughs> I think it's Cus, Cus, Cuspicephalus scarfi. Tell me how that came about. Well, there was some guy, a paleontologist, walking along the Kimridge coast, the Dorset coast, where, which is the Jurassic coast, I think they call it, because it has a lot of um, fossils in it. And he discovered the bones of what he was very excited to feel was a, a tetrasaur, which is a, a type of uh, pterodactyl. And uh, it's quite a small one, I suppose, by the, the, the size of things. Uh, shall we say about a metre and a half long? And um, he, um, he very kindly asked if he could name this new find because there was no other one like it after me. And um, he's... He, I said, why? He said, well, because, you know, it reminds me the sharp beak and the aquiline kind of and the beady eyes and everything remind me so much of your drawings of Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> and so, you guys, I, I, I guess you're lucky it wasn't named after her. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, so Mrs. Actually, Mrs. Thatcher got a revenge. She turned me into a dinosaur. So I, you know, <laughs> I actually have it now hanging in my studio above, flying above in the kind of, as a, like a museum piece on... Um, so she, it hovers over me all day when I'm working. <laughs> Look, but, uh, but right before I let you go, um, it, it was announced yesterday that uh, sort of late era Pink Floyd music, I think from 1985 onwards, as long as, uh, along with Dave Gilmore's music, are no longer going to be streamed in Russia. Uh, does that seem in keeping with you, with the uh, with the kind of the um, well, I guess the, all the ideas and the ideology behind the wall? I mean, this can't be a surprise. I'm not at all surprised. No, I didn't know that, but uh, that that's, that's interesting, and I, I think it's the right decision but i mean uh, um i wouldn't call you know it, i well i suppose it is a political piece you know? mm, so, yeah so. well look wonderful thanks very much indeed for joining us that's uh that's gerald scarf uh but behind well behind behind so many things but but for the purpose of this conversation behind the art of pink floyd the wall uh thanks very much for being with us gerald and let's uh finish with a tiny bit more of pink floyd mm -hmm. 